Well, good morning to Pastor John and our James River campus, to Pastor Mac and the Buford Road campus. God is good and all the time. Join me if wherever you have been today, you've enjoyed good worship from wonderful praise teams gifted by God. Would you help me thank them? They have done an awesome job. Awesome. Thank them so much for their gifts that they share with us. I want to invite you as we begin today to put yourself in a strange scenario. I want you to think about the fact that you've been told you're going to die. You don't have much longer. And that as a part of that understanding of, of this position you're in right now, that you're going to have one last chance to address your family. Could be your immediate family, could be some extended family. What would you say? What would be the things that would come to your mind? My guess is all of us would like to think that when such a time comes that we would fantasize about having some time to share some very personal words with those whom we love in our immediate or extended family. And yet the reality is many of us will make it to the end of life and we will not have that opportunity to impress upon them some thoughts or some reminders, some words that we want to share with them. Words that perhaps we want to be remembered by or even words that we want remembered in the lives of those with whom we speak into. Now, for some folks, their last words aren't spoken, but instead they're cemented upon grave markers on tombstones. I love researching, or anytime I'm in a graveyard, I like to walk around and see what's been written, these inscriptions that are on tombstones, but I found some this week. These are epitaphs is what they're described as, and epitaphs are something by which a person or a time or an event will be remembered. They often tell a story. If you look beyond the words, you can hear a story echoing in the words that they tell. It would have been their last words, if you will, at least these are the words they'll be remembered by. And so here's a few of them. I like this one. Here lies Henry Blake. He stepped on the gas instead of the brake. Now, you know, there's a whole story that's told there in how his life, uh, was, he lost his life. I like this one. The name is Dawn Under, not Down Under, Dawn, D-A-W-N. And this is what it reads. Here lies my wife. I bid her goodbye. She rests in peace and now so do I. Again, there's a whole story behind that, right? He's making a point here. This one, George w, w. Jr. was simply this quote on his tombstone. I knew this would happen. Well, eventually it's going to happen to all of us, right? Robert Clay Allison, I'm glad I never met him, but this was the quote on his tombstone. He never killed a man who didn't need killing. Wow, can you imagine? Those are the words that he's remembered by in his life. I like this one. These last words are obviously spoken by a spouse who said in quotes, finally, now I know something you don't. Think about that. But my favorite of all is this one. I've made some good deals and I've made some bad deals, but I really went in the hole on this one. Yes, you'll catch that later. These last words are obviously humorous, but on a more serious note, if we begin to think about what are the words that we would impress upon uh, those who would be listening to us, not only with uh, the words we share, but how did our life live out those words? And indeed, as we come to this last Sunday of this journey we've taken of walking with Moses in the wilderness, we're going to come to his last words today. Much of what we read about him in the final days comes to us in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is now a hundred and 20 years old. God has informed him he would not personally walk into the promised land, but he would have a chance to see it from Mount Nebo from afar. And as Moses prepares the Israelites to move into the promised land, he's got something on his mind. Last words. He's got something that's kind of bubbling underneath him that he wants to speak not only into their present, but into their future. And the words that he has for them are words for you and for me. Words about where we are today and about words that we need to hear about tomorrow for future generation. Words really that could be repeated by every generation, if you will. So as the time has come now for the Israelites to move into the promised land, we, we catch up with Moses who is fearful. Moses is worried. He's afraid. He's anxious. And what's informing him is the possibility that as the Israelites move into the promised land that they might forget that they might forget who they are, that they might forget whose they are, that they indeed might forget why God even brought them into this land. And so with all of this in mind, Moses prepares his last words to be shared with the Israelites. I'm standing back now because we're at the end of this story and I, I can't even begin to imagine what Moses is feeling for his people. Standing there at 120 years of age, 
It was just a mere 80 years before this that he was watching his people be oppressed in the land of Egypt by Pharaoh and the slave taskmasters to the point he became so angry he murdered one and ran to the desert. It's only been 40 years since he heard God's voice calling to him out of the bush that was on fire but it wasn't being consumed, telling him to go back to Egypt and ask Pharaoh to set his people free. And you can imagine Moses thinking back in his mind about the, the battle royale of the ten plagues that took place between our God, the God, and the useless Egyptian gods and goddesses and how Pharaoh was brought to his knees in the tenth round letting the Israelites go. And can you imagine the heartbeat of Moses as he began to imagine and think back about the Red Sea parting and how all the Israelites walked through safe only to bring the doom upon Pharaoh's army. All of those feelings going on inside of him. Might I say this, as he prepares to address the Israelites, this isn't the same bunch that he walked into this area with. Indeed, the matter of fact, the surviving Israelites that he would be addressing they wouldn't even remember what it was like to be a slave in Egypt because they hadn't been born. Indeed, they didn't see all the great miracles and the powerful things, the theophanies on Mount Sinai that God showed up and the wind and the thunder and the earthquakes. You see, all those who had experienced that firsthand had now died. And the only reason these other Israelites knew about it was because of oral history. They'd been told these stories by their, by their, by their parents and their grandparents. And so here stands Moses, knowing he is going to die, knowing that these folks were fixing to walk into a land that was flowing with milk and honey. They would become prosperous. Knowing perhaps he was fearful that they might forget what God had done for their ancestors and for their nation. And they might slowly drift away from God or not only drift away from him, but completely lose a relationship altogether. And worse than that, Moses was worried they would forget about their mission why God had even brought them to the promised land. You, you remember the mission? It'll sound very familiar. Their mission was to become a kingdom of priests who would make God known to the world. Sound familiar? It should. It's our mission. And every generation since this and to come, this will be their mission. But his basic fear in a nutshell, that they would forget. Forget God. Forget who he was. Forget what he'd done for them and what in the past, what he was doing for them now and what he would do for them in the future. I think if we were to give the theme of Moses' last words, then perhaps it might come in the form of an epitaph, something that could fit on his gravestone and it would simply be this. Pass it on. Pass it on. Which leads to the question, what is to be passed on? And so 38 verses in Deuteronomy directly speak of him coming in admonishing, trying to get the Israelites fired up to pass on the story, to tell the story, not only to your children, but to your children's children, if you will. That's why we read in Deuteronomy 6 there, verse 6, these commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. It's, he says, impress them on your children. Emphasize, stress, underline these things on your children. Talk about them when you sit down, when you're awake, when you're walking along the road, when you get up at all times, it should never stop. Why? Deuteronomy 6, 2 tells us, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life. Fear, awe-inspiring respect, if you will. Just in complete, just mouth agape, can't believe the power of God so that you'll be blessed all the days of your life. Moses understood the message of God was one generation away from extinction. We've dealt with much of that in our entire life too. Every generation faces somewhat of this same challenge. But here Moses was correct then and he's correct now. It's our job to pass on the story, to pass it on to our children, to our children's children, if you will, and it never stops. Indeed, and hear me, church, I want us to know this is more than bringing our kids to, to Sunday school and to vacation Bible school and to church to worship. It's all that, but it's also more. It's becoming inclusive in the language around the table at home that these conversations enter into everyday normal conversation. Indeed. What does it look like when the last time you were with your children or your children's children or other folks that you had influence on and you began to talk about the importance of God in your life? 
when you reminded them about your journey of faith and how God has shown up time after time after time in your own journey of faith, to put it in your own words. Indeed, conversations that are not forced, but come out of daily life together. They need to hear us articulate our faith journey so that our last words at the end will be remembered that those were words that were lived out in our life. Moses was so afraid, so afraid that this present generation he was talking to would enter the promised land and and forget their faith, or worse yet, lose it altogether. As a matter of fact, there's recorded in his last words over 15 times he uses words like remember, don't forget, pass it on. It was this repetitive kind of phrasing that he was trying to make sure the Israelites understood. I want you to hear what some of it sounded like from Deuteronomy 8, uh, chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. Because he says, if you don't do this, otherwise when you eat and are satisfied and when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and your flocks, they grow large and your silver and your gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud. And you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And to verse 17, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today and in all future generations. This was a warning to the Israelites as much as it is a warning to you and to me today that we we would say to others, we are a nation proudly. We're proud of our nation and we've been blessed by God. And yet when we say that, there should be, there should be this deep, deep deep-seated conviction and fearfulness that along with that blessing comes a what? A responsibility. With the privilege comes this incredible responsibility to pass it on. Because friends, our rights as Christians, our rights, if you will, are granted only by the grace of Jesus Christ and what he did on his cross. Amen? Not given by any constitution or any law. Holy, totally respect those. Totally stand in awe of those. But the ultimate freedom of my soul and your soul is bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. It's the only way we can be set free. So here, Moses is worried that they may become so comfortable in this land, this promised land flowing with milk and honey, that they they might change their song. Instead of singing, it's me, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer, they may end up changing the words. It's me, it's me, it's me, O Lord, look and see how mighty I am. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord. Look and see what I have done. You see, if we're not careful, our song becomes about us instead of the one who allowed us to be made free by what he did. Said another way, it's ours. We worked for it. He was so afraid they would walk in and take possession of the land and just settle in and say, look what we've done for ourselves. The converse of this is if Jesus would have said for, to us, well, I died for my sins. What what are you going to do for yours? I I took care of my salvation. I worked for it. What are you going to do for yours? It is this recognition that our, our salvation is to be worked out in passing it on, in sharing what we've been given from God Almighty, what God and only God could and has made possible to all of us. Walter Brueggemann, a fantastic scholar, described it in these ways. He said, you know, you you step back at the 50,000 foot view and you watch this journey that the Israelites have been on. And he said, I want to suggest to you that they basically ran through this cycle of three seasons. Orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. And the more I began to listen to this, I thought, oh my gosh, he's describing my life. He may be describing yours too. When he talks about in this season of orientation is when for the Israelites, everything was perfect. That's when they'd been brought out of the land of of, of slavery, freedom. For the first time in over 400 years, generations now set free. They felt blessed. Life was good. They had everything they needed. God was leading them. And then it began to happen. That other song, prone to wonder, 
prone to leave the God I know. And in the midst of this, they began to whine and complain. They began to get so comfortable perhaps with who God was. They forgot who they were, whose they were, and what God had done for them. And so their discipline began to wane, if you will. Exit orientation, enter disorientation. Where we stop being intentional in our discipline of walking with God. In the midst of this, just as the Israelites began to to complain and whine and moan, they forgot all about God's mighty acts of deliverance. And what they wanted, they always wanted more. And when they got more, you know what else they wanted? More. It is in this season of disorientation that somebody can wake up one day and all of a sudden begin to say, where's God? Where are you, God? Where have you gone? When all along the reality is God never moved. But it was you, it was me. It was we who displaced ourselves like the prodigal son, leaving home, taking what we thought was ours to go and live a free life. And in the midst of this, we begin to feel the sting of the consequences of our decisions. And so we sit down in the pigsty and cry in despair, where are you, God? Where are you? Opportunity here to exit disorientation and now move to reorientation. Thank God. This is a season in which God offers you, offers me, offers all of us who are in disorientation phase or season to repent, to confess, to turn our life around, and to become faithful to Him, and He restores us to Himself. We are reoriented to Him. We are redeemed to Him. It's amazing to me, this Bible gives us these seasons over thousands of years ago, and guess what? The seasons haven't left. We're still living them today, aren't we? Perhaps we should camp here for just a moment. Perhaps we should pause and ask ourselves, so where am I? In what season do I find myself? Am I in the season of orientation? I I feel blessed by God. I I feel like and, and, and I just believe I'm kind of walking in, in willful obedience to him and that, that all is good. Hallelujah if you're there. Praise God that you're there. And be careful. Be vigilant. Be intentional about staying in the disciplines of the faith. It is such a short step into the next season of disorientation. Perhaps that's where some of us are. Maybe we've become desensitized to our own sins. You know, when you keep creating a sin, you keep doing the same sin over and over, it it tends to lose its edge. We're not as sensitive to it. We don't feel as guilty anymore or as convicted by it. Perhaps in our wondering, we've become desensitized. We've become less intentional about following up on our disciplines. Maybe we feel like we're in a foreign land, just like the prodigal son was. And yes, we too are feeling the consequences of our decisions, crying out in despair, where are you, God? Maybe you're in this season or need to move. We need to move to this season of reorientation. Thank God we have an opportunity to come home to him. Thank God that he stands ready to redeem us, ready to forgive us if we repent and ask for forgiveness because we know this, God is faithful every time. He will not forsake us nor abandon us. Moses' last words were not only words to the Israelites for them to pass it on, but he reminded them what they were to pass on. And it's the same message we need to be passing on today. It comes out of Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Israel, listen. Our God is the Lord. Only the Lord. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. We know later, the New Testament, Jesus comes and he adds to that. But at this moment, this was their message. And so Moses pleads to the people, do not forget this command, pass it on. Moses has said what he needed to say, his last words. Following this speech, he he formally passed his leadership over to Joshua as his successor. He turned and he walked up the mountain to Mount Nebo, which is where God would at least let him view the promised land across the valley. But while Moses was viewing the promised land, 
we need to understand he wasn't just viewing some 8,000 square miles, if you, eight, yeah, square miles that would later make up the modern state of Israel. No, no, no. What he was viewing was an ideal. The promised land was meant to be seen as the kingdom of heaven. An ideal. God's, God's place, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. It was his way of saying, look, if you will follow these commands, then you're going to be able to take this land. You're not going to, you're not going to kill each other. You're going to love each other. You're going to keep justice and mercy in front of you always. And so you will enjoy a taste of heaven here on earth as it is in heaven, which is what we pray. That was the ideal for them and for us if we pass it on. The conclusion of walking with Moses happens in Deuteronomy 34, 5. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. In my sanctified imagination, I think there's a grave marker there. And all it says is, pass it on. What will our grave marker read? What will be the words we will be remembered for? Pray with me. Our God, into these very sacred moments of invitation, Lord, that we'll be invited by our campus pastors to consider what God has said to us in this hour about our life, about our faith, about our journey with you. God, thank you for Moses. What an incredible journey it's been. 120 years full of life of seeing your presence, the power of it, and all that it offers. And you're no different today than you were then. Just as available, just as present, just as powerful, wanting desperately to live in our lives, in our hearts, and in our minds and for us to take responsibility to pass it on, to live out the words we want remembered. God, speak to us in these moments. In the name and in the power of your son, Jesus Christ, who saves us, we pray together. Amen.